you spoke a little bit about flagella, the other um, argument that's always drawn up is the, is the, is the mammalian eye. Oh, and yes, that, again, the classic. That's too, okay. It goes back to the 1700s, really. Right. So yeah. could you maybe dispel that a little bit for us, um, that the, the idea that the eye is too complex mm -hmm. um, a system to have evolved, that it must have had some intelligence? You know, if you read the creationist literature, and I don't want to wish that on anyone, uh, but if you do, um, you'll find that they're very fond of uh, quoting a statement that Darwin made in On the Origin of Species, where I, and I haven't memorized it, but it's something like, and it is really quite preposterous to imagine that something like the vertebrate eye, and it's so snazzy, it, he, he didn't say snazzy, but you know, it's got all these parts that work together to bring light to the eye and form an image, and it's just, I'm sure it's just, and nobody would, would think it would be possible for my natural selection to produce this. And the creationists all say, see, Darwin himself says that the eye can't evolve. And, but they, they've never really looked at the book because they just keep quoting each other. And if you actually go to The Origin of Species and you find that passage and you continue reading it, he goes, the very next sentence is, but I can assure you that that's not the case, that I can do this. And then he goes on with this wonderful description of how, how it's quite possible to take a very simple structure and with very few modifications, uh, improve its ability to um, assist an organism. In other words, in Darwinian terms, in Darwin's own terms, it would have adaptive value. And he then does this wonderful thing of, of go which Darwin did all his life, of course. He was a wonderful naturalist. He went out to nature and he looked at nature and said, you know, there's something that's kind of like what I'm talking about. And if you look at the eye of a snail, it's hardly more than just a slight, a, a slight pigmented spot on the on the uh, uh, surface of the skin there. But you know, having a, a having a pigmented spot does allow you to tell uh, light from dark. So that's adaptive to a snail. That that would actually help a snail get along better. So any ancestral primitive snail that uh, or creature that had this light sensitive uh, spot uh, would would be at an advantage, and so would you know live longer and as we'd say today pass on its genes more than than a creature of the same species that didn't have that. And then he goes on and says, well, you know, here's, here's another kind of creature, another little invertebrate creature, uh, the limpet, that has that pigmented spot, but it also has kind of a little bit of an indentation on the skin where that pigmented spot occurs. And that's an advantage. That's actually better than that snail eye because having an indentation as well as that pigmented spot allows you to get an idea of what direction the light's coming from. So that's even better than being able to tell light from dark. And by the way, if you look at the physiology of this, being able to tell light from dark is useful for, an, for many creatures. I mean, lots and lots and lots of, of organisms, plant, uh, animals, for uh, setting the biological clock, so to speak, for certain physiological reactions that happen. Uh, being able to tell what direction the light is coming from is very useful because that might help you uh, uh, navigate for, uh, toward or um, toward food, for example, or away from heat or away from other kinds of phenomena that you might want to avoid or, or be attracted to. And then Darwin goes on and says, well, you know, the next thing you do, you, he finds another animal. And he points to it as, as having not only the, 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 you know, some wiring down here at the bottom and this cup shaped thing, but, but actually um, the, the cup is formed almost to a, a, a pinhole. And it's kind of the equivalent of the old fashioned pinhole cameras that you know, people had in the early 20th century. Nobody has them now, of course, because we've all gone far beyond that. But a pinhole camera is a big advantage over just having a cup because a pinhole camera uh, actually can allow an image to focus on the back of the eye. So anyway, he, he builds up the system step by step by step by step. And actually on NCSE's uh, website, we've got a little video talking about the evolution of the eye in the same fashion. And then you add an, a lens, and that, that's an improvement as well. So. What Darwin does is look at the eye, the, the final product, the vertebrate eye, which is a very snazzy kind of organ. It's really good about getting images to the eye and getting that information to the brain. But he shows you how from very, very simple beginnings, there's an adaptive value to each step until you finally build up to the final product. Now what the intelligent design folks want to do is they want us to start there. They want us to start at that final complex snazzy uh, multi-component uh, 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 form and say, couldn't possibly form by natural causes. 
but actually it's very possible for it to form. And what's kind of interesting about the eye story is that there were some, I think there were Swedish scientists, and I'm sorry I have seen your moment here, I don't remember the exact reference, but um, there were some, some investigators who did some computer modeling for you know, how long would it take, given such and such a mutation rate for changing the surface of the, uh, the skin and, and causing the um, uh, cup forming and the pinhole eye and the formation, you know, um, lens from crystalline structures that are already there and so forth and so on. How long would it take to evolve an eye from something like Darwin's original pig pigmented patch? And it w found that it could be done in a, something like 100 million years or something, which geologically speaking is a drop in the bucket. 